Hi, Mr. Cox, thank you so much for making time to join us. We're really thank looking you. forward to this conversation. Um, I'm Good Colleen. <laughs> thank you. I'm Colleen McCain Nelson. I'm the executive editor of the Sacramento Bee, and I wanted Thanks. to kick things off by asking you about the recall process itself. I'm interested to hear from you what you think the threshold for recalling a governor should be. Um, governor Gavin Newsom has suggested that in California we're moving toward weaponizing the recall process. Um, it's clear that you disagree with Governor Newsom on a wide range of issues, and some voters do too. So my question question for you is, are policy differences sufficient to recall a governor in the middle of his term, or what should the standard for a recall be? Well, I think it's it was intended to remove an official who had uh, strayed, uh, I suppose, away from uh, his initial mission. Uh, you know, some people think it should be just for uh, corruption or official misconduct of some sort. And I actually don't agree with that. Uh, I think it should be uh, available to be used when pe the, a, a, a significant number of people believe that the state is so seriously headed in the wrong direction that it needs uh, action sooner than the next election. And uh, I think that's exactly the situation that California is in today. Uh, Certainly, I will hopefully get into the issues, but uh, I think with the volume of crises and responses to those crises that are hitting California and that have, have been hitting California since Mr. Newsom was elected, I think it's certainly appropriate for the for the people. Uh, and, and let me tell you, I think California's constitution is geared towards giving power to the people for them to take the action to change the direction of this state. I will tell you, that if Mr. Newsom were an executive in a business of any sort, uh, the shareholders of that business would not want to wait for another year to change the direction of that business um, because more serious damage could, could, could happen to that business. And so I would submit to you that uh, it's, it's a good thing to remove an executive who is leading the state in seri a seriously wrong direction and, and give the people that power. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cox. The next question is from Yousef Baig. Hi, John. Good to be with you. <clears throat> thank you, Yousef. Time today. I wanted to touch on the pandemic uh, to start. Obviously, you know, this recall might not even be here without some of the actions that people have taken issue with over the course of the pandemic. Um, counties have started reimposing mask mandates uh, with the Delta variant now accounting for 83% of, of infections and almost all hospitalizations. Uh, many Republicans flout public health orders, and, and some try to discredit experts like Dr. Fauci, agencies like the CDC. Um, as governor, would you follow the guidance of our experts? And, and if the FDA were to fully approve COVID vaccines uh, later this year, would you support a vaccine requirement to help get us out of this pandemic? Well, you know, there's one thing that being alive for 66 years gives you its perspective on so-called experts, because there, I've met a lot of them. And uh, there's many that are wrong and, uh, and, and many that are right. And I think it's important to differentiate uh, and use good judgment in that respect. Uh, I certainly will get the Council of Experts as the governor of the state. Uh, I will say that I think this recall certainly has its genesis before the pandemic uh, with some you know, serious uh, deficiencies and actions by the governor prior to the pandemic. Uh, I think the pandemic has illustrated even uh, a greater uh, weakness on the part of this governor in terms of management skill. Uh, I would certainly not have kept the state shut down as long as it is. Um, I, uh, my mother-in-law lives in Florida. My two nephews live in Orlando. Uh, and uh, I think the proper response to this pandemic would have been to protect the vulnerable. Uh, make sure that testing was done uh, as rapidly and as expansively as possible. Uh, but I would not have kept businesses as shut as long as they have been. I would not have kept my uh, the, the children of this state out of uh, contact with uh, teaching professionals for as long as happened. And uh, I think we can see in terms of the overall results, uh, despite the fact that Florida has a much older population than California, its death rate... Uh, uh, and case rate weren't significantly different than, than California, yet California lost many thousands more businesses 
and uh, our children lost uh, much more time in school in front of a teacher, and that's regrettable. And um, I think that uh, hopefully in the future, we're better prepared for pandemics, and we also learn uh, how to deal with them a lot better. I believe Yusuf has a follow-up. Just wanted to pin down the, the second piece of the question too. I, I, obviously vaccines are, are viewed, I think, by most experts, doctors, everyone is the way out of this pandemic. Would you mandate them or like we're seeing many people do, including the governor or no? No, I would not mandate vaccines for this for this illness. This illness is 99.99% survivable by people in good health. Uh, people who have vulnerabilities, people who are elderly, people who have other diseases that expose them to greater danger, certainly should be vaccinated. And I've been vaccinated. Uh, I would recommend that everybody who wants the vaccine should be vaccinated. Uh, I would submit to you that, uh, first of all, there's literally millions of people in California who did get the disease. Uh, those that are reported, as well as a lot of people that, that the medical authorities believe didn't report the fact that they were ill. Uh, those people have antibodies and therefore don't need the vaccine. Uh, there's also a significant number of people uh, who are are young and uh, have decided for what one reason or another, assessing the risk reward themselves, have decided not to be vaccinated. Uh, one of the big issues I think, and I hope we discuss it, is the fact that a lot of people don't trust governmental leadership. And I think Gavin Newsom is exhibit A in why people don't trust government. Uh, this is obviously the governor who broke his own rules uh, hypocritically going to a dinner with uh, lobbyists. Uh, but on top of that, this is a governor who hands out no bid contracts to political donors, who also solicits uh, charitable contributions to his wife's foundation, where his wife gets a significant salary. Uh, I believe that leadership is important and leadership has to exhibit uh, integrity and to be trusted. Integrity is the coin of the realm. And I think what this, uh, the failure of a lot of people to get the vaccination is the product of a lack of trust in leadership and in government in general. And one of the things that I'll work to address as the governor is to re, uh, uh, I guess, reignite uh, people's trust. Uh, and that begins with transparency. That begins with telling the truth. That that begins with uh, doing things uh, that exhibit uh, or that uh, build trust in uh, in leadership and not erode it like Mr. Newsom has. Uh, Mr. Koss, I want to follow up on that. The Delta sure. variant uh, is causing number uh, transmissions to spike again. Yes, yes, uh, and it's quite serious and getting worse by the day. Uh, I appreciate that you are vaccinated, uh, I'm vaccinated, but um, a lot of our fellow Californians for whatever reason and uh, do not want to get vaccinated and voluntary vaccinations is not working. So uh, I, I just want to stay with that point that uh, I understand what you're saying and I appreciate that you are vaccinated, but it's getting worse. And wouldn't you be on the hook for that if you were the governor, if you were saying, that it should be voluntary and, and, and more people get sick and more people die. Well, again, uh, this is a disease that's 99.99% survivable. The Delta variant is, uh, as I understand it, more transmissible, but there's a difference of opinion among experts uh, as to whether it's more dangerous or less dangerous than the original COVID uh, uh, strain. So uh, I'm not sure that I, I, I accept uh, the, 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 the the uh, intonation that uh, that this is far more dangerous. Uh, yes, I think people should get vaccinated and I think people should be doing it voluntarily. Frankly, I think the idea of making the vaccine mandatory uh, and actually requiring mass wearing on the part of vaccinated people is, is counterproductive to getting people to believe in it. So uh, I, uh, I, I, I will respectfully disagree with, with making it mandatory. Well, but on the subject of eroding trust, aren't members of your own party leading the way of eroding trust, starting with President Trump and current members of Congress who are who are causing people to uh, uh, not have uh, a vaccination when they should? Well, listen, uh, 
I have recommended in every interview that people get vaccinated. And my wife is vaccinated. My daughter is vaccinated, even though she's only 16. So I'm leading by example. I can't control what other people do. And this is not about congressman or the former president. This is about California. And I trust that we're going to take some time to talk about the, the crises and the issues that are facing Californians, housing, homelessness, electricity, water, crime, wildfires, our horrendous education system, the cost of living, the tax burden. I hope we're going to get a chance to talk about those as well as uh, the uh, the pandemic and the vaccination situation. We are going to touch on all those topics. And, and having said that, I will turn it over to uh, my colleague, Hannah Hoser, who has a question about homelessness. Hi, Mr. Cox. Yes, we're, we're getting to the crises that you yeah. mentioned. I have actually yes. two questions for you about homelessness. So I'll give them one at a time. Here's the first. Can you tell us more about your proposed treatment first, housing second approach to solving the state's homelessness crisis? What would that look like and how would that work? Well, thank you. Uh, and, and absolutely, I believe that what we have for the most part, not all of it, some part of homelessness is the cost of housing and the fact that people have lost their jobs or just can't afford their rent or can't afford uh, their house payment any longer. That's a separate issue. Uh, most of the studies that I've seen peg the number from 50 to 75 percent of people that are homeless uh, due to uh, substance abuse or mental illness. And I think it, it it's 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 not a successful uh, effort to just put people into housing and uh, not make sure that they're also treated at the same time. So I don't, I, I'm not advocating completely that we don't provide residential uh, uh, opportunities to them. I'm saying that any residential treatment has to also involve uh, a requirement of treatment. And uh, that treatment may well have to be forced with a conservatorship if need be, but uh, we've got to treat mental illness, we've got to treat the addiction to substances, and we can't ignore the fact that uh, a lot of these people think that it's okay uh, to, to live on the streets. Uh, I think there's a, there's a, there's a growing body uh, of, of good opinion that would say that uh, our prior Housing First efforts have been a disastrous failure, and uh, frankly, the numbers illustrate that. Uh, we've got to make sure that we uh, we expand the opportunities for treatment. I'd like to do that with public-private partnerships where we can. Uh, there are fortunately, you know, literally uh, dozens of uh, programs around the state uh, where people are uh, not only given residential uh, uh, advantages but also get the treatment that they need. Uh, Solutions for Change in Carlsbad, uh, right near me here. Uh, the Dream Center in Los Angeles, the San Diego Rescue Mission. Uh, some of these are secular, some of them are non-secular. Um, uh, I don't much care either way. I, what I wanna do is solve the problem. And solving the problem means you've gotta get people the treatment and the, and the, uh, and the mental illness care that, the, that they deserve. Uh, the other part of my homeless plan, of course, is to build uh, lower cost housing. And, uh, and that we have to do at scale. Uh, and we have to change a lot of the things that we're doing right now. Uh, my second question for you regarding homelessness is as follows. Homelessness is getting worse in California and not better. Commissions have been established. Uh, millions have been committed to the problem and yet it gets mm -hmm. worse. You yep. have criticized the state spending of billions of dollars to deal with homelessness, but um, according to some of my research, you haven't said specifically how or where you would reduce spending. So where would you cut spending while also dealing with the state's worsening homelessness crisis? And in order to reach your goal of cutting homelessness in half in five years, what does the budget for that look like? Well, I, I haven't formulated a specific budget. I'll work on that once I'm governor. But I, I will say that uh, we have thrown literally billions of dollars at this problem. And again, it's because we've emphasized just providing shelter and just getting people off the street instead of having long-term treatment uh, fixes uh, that should be applied. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm reminded the stories I read about uh, Los Angeles building uh, homeless uh, uh, units for 500,000 a door. Uh, we've got to bring down the cost of building in general, uh, but we also have to make sure that any effort to, to do so with public funds is, is 
used efficiently. And 500,000 a door is just outrageous. Uh, I build for 100,000 a door in, uh, in Indiana. Now I understand the land cost is far different, but a lot of the cost that's, uh, that, that inflates this uh, housing cost in California is uh, government regulation, excessive government regulation and permitting fees and delays and, and mandates that, that, could be, that should be reexamined and reduced. Mr. Cox, hi, Tad Weber with the Fresno Bee. Good to see you again. Nice to meet you, Tad. Um, I wanted to loop back to something you mentioned just a second ago, because I think it's very germane to the topic of homelessness. That's mental health treatment. So mm -hmm. if you were uh, elected as governor, tell us what kind of mental health programming you would put in place from where we are today. Well, I'm not a, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, so I'm not going to venture into the world of exa exactly what kinds of treatments, but I do know that there's treatments out there. And uh, there have been instances with clients of mine and family members of mine where I'm privy to the uh, ability to treat mental illness. Uh, some of it can be done with psychotropic drugs. Some of it can be done with counseling. And, you know, that's, uh, I think that's generally accepted uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, yeah, Mr. Cross, I, I want to follow up on that one as well, and I, I appreciate that uh, it's more it's more challenging for a, a candidate to be an expert on all issues uh, yeah. when they're running. Having said that, though, and having covered homelessness, particularly in the last decade, it's a very complex issue, uh, and so I, I do think that uh, voters would would appreciate a little more specificity from you. We're all we all see that it's terrible. We all we all uh, see what's happening on our streets, but, but right. can you offer any more specificity on on what you would do to deal with people who have been recently incarcerated or to people who have uh, serious mental illness or substance abuse that isn't being done right now? Well, you you mentioned the the recently incarcerated. I think what we need to do is we need job training and we need uh, very specific. Uh, uh, help in that regard. And uh, I visited the Dream Center, for example, in Los Angeles and witnessed uh, their facilities for providing job training, uh, skill sets that are created. Uh, you know, we have a tremendous shortage of skilled craftsmen to build the homes that we need. Uh, a lot of these uh, organizations have the ability to teach carpentry and plumbing and electric uh, electrical work and, and basic uh, uh, trades uh, efforts. Uh, frankly, a lot of that isn't being taught in our schools, which is a whole other issue that I'd like to address. Uh, but uh, we could certainly do a lot more with, with job training. And, you know, what people need as well is they need to get a start. They need a place that expects them to be there and will monitor to make sure that they are there. So there's some worth to the idea that people living in a residential uh, center like the Dream Center, for example, have people there who are supervising and 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 are making sure that they actually get up in the morning, actually get to, you know, get themselves ready for work, report, and actually do a day's work and 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 have the uh, life skills, if you will, that will allow them to do that. Uh, Mr. Cox, we will continue on with our colleague Garth Stapley. In my area, uh, our economy depends heavily on agriculture. Absolutely. You mentioned water as a crisis yep. issue. And so, uh, you know, the, the California water wars have, um, they, they need to be resolved for, for our people and our economy here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what, what you would do to resolve them. Do you support the voluntary agreements or do you have some, some other idea? Well, what, what I, the idea I have is to increase supply. Uh, we have the Pacific Ocean right out so alongside our coastline. Uh, Israel has done a great job of converting a desert into a agricultural uh, paradise in, in many ways through desalination. We should be doing a lot more of that. Uh, we should be investing far more in storage as well as the canals. Uh, the California Water Project was built by a pragmatic Governor Pat Brown in a little bit more than a decade. Uh, but since that time, uh, uh, there's been obviously uh, quite a bit of uh, political discussion about uh, uh, 
maintaining it and expanding it. Uh, I think we absolutely need to do that. The population of the state has grown significantly uh, and our agricultural uh, community is, is, uh, is huge and, and in need of the help. Uh, so we, we definitely have to have more storage. Uh, we have to have more uh, sources like desalination and recycling. Uh, I'm optimistic that we can do these things. We, we, should, we should be looking at uh, creating an abundance of supply and, and not just uh, rationing. And I'm afraid that that's what's the, what the current political leadership of the state wants to do. Uh, we have tremendous uh, resources available to us if we can only use them. We obviously live in a desert, which is prone to drought. Uh, it's a desert on the ocean. But as I said, by uh, applying a pragmatic approach, we created the California Water Project and we need to expand that and, uh, and, and supplement it with desalination and, and recycling to make sure that we reuse water that we have as well as generate new sources. Sure, all good ideas and thank you for commenting on that, but I need to nail you down on just that one thing. If you support the voluntary agreements that have been negotiated by our our irrigation districts? Well, I guess the question would be, are they really that voluntary? Uh, and uh, I think that uh, clearly the, the, the water wars, as you refer to them in California, uh, have, a, have a long history. And we have, I, I believe, something like 30 water districts that are very, very powerful and, uh, and, and basically hold in their hands life and death for uh, a lot of farmers, particularly small farmers. Uh, uh, I, I, that's an issue that I would like to defer on and, uh, uh, uh discuss at a later time. Uh, but, uh, I'm not con totally convinced that that's a voluntary, uh, process. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Finucane. I'm the How are opinion you, Stephanie? editor. I'm good. Thank you. I'm the opinion, opinion editor at the Tribune in San Luis Obispo County. And okay. I have a couple of questions about energy for you. Uh, our area is home to Diablo Canyon, which is the last mm -hmm. operating nuclear power plant in the state. Uh, it's scheduled to shut down and starting in 2024. But now mm -hmm. some nuclear power supporters are saying there's no way that California can generate enough clean energy and meet its clean energy goals if Diablo closes. So my first question to you is, do you believe that Diablo Canyon should remain open? Well, I think what we need to do is expand our alternatives for generation of electricity. Uh, wind and solar is just not going to supply enough. Uh, we we have significant supplies of electricity generated by natural gas, but we've decommissioned quite a few plants over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, we've also decommissioned, as you said, nuclear. Uh, there's a whole new generation of nuclear uh, uh, capability that's come online in recent years. Again, I'm not a nuclear physicist uh, or a nuclear engineer, but I do know that there are many countries around the world that are generating significant uh, percentages of their energy from nuclear power. Uh, so in terms of the Diablo Canyon, uh, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the very specific aspects of that power plant as to whether it's safe, whether it's operating. It's, it's certainly operating right now and it's certainly not causing uh, any issues. Um, but I think nuclear power should be on the table. and We should be looking to increasing the availability of nuclear power in California. Um, I also believe that we also need to, to increase uh, hydroelectric power. Uh, the Sacramento River, as I understand it, has one hydroelectric facility. Uh, the, uh, the Mississippi River has 29. Now, obviously, the Mississippi is bigger, but we can, we can certainly do more with hydro uh, as well as with natural gas, uh, which, is a, which is a clean burning fossil fuel. Uh, we have tremendous resources of oil and natural gas in California, and I think those should be developed. Um, I think the world uh, environment would be terrifically benefited if uh, natural gas that's produced in the United States were to be liquefied and shipped over to China. Uh, China now is producing uh, more global permission, pollution uh, than the rest of the world combined, according to what I've read. And uh, China and India are building coal-fired 
uh, electricity plants just about every week. They've got an insatiable uh, dem uh, demand for electricity. Uh, natural gas is not found at, at great quantity in China. And if we could develop natural gas resources and LNG facilities uh, in California, we would get the benefit of that export earnings and, and the taxes on that. Uh, and we would help the world environment as well because coal is clearly uh, uh, the major contributor to global pollution uh, and climate change. And uh, natural gas is a, is, a, is a relatively clean burning fossil fuel. Okay, if we could focus specifically on California, you've yep. said you want to make energy less expensive and more reliable. What Absolutely. steps would you immediately take to make that happen? I would. I I think I said that I would want to go and look at more nuclear power. It, 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 there are there's a tremendous advances that have been undergone, as as I understand them, uh, in uh, not not even large scale plants, but small scale plants uh, that could be that could be safely uh, uh, installed. Uh, and so I think there's tremendous opportunities in nuclear power. Uh, I also think that uh, natural gas, again, uh, the U.S. is blessed with tremendous stores of natural gas. It's a relatively clean burning fuel, and uh, we could certainly uh, have more diversified sources. Uh, wind and solar are great as well. There's uh, The price of solar has come down tremendously, and uh, I can see uh, you know more availability of storage as well. There's a new as I understand it, there's new battery technologies that are available as well. Uh, Iron Air is one that I've uh, particularly read about recently that uh, can uh, discharge over several days. Uh, storage is obviously the big impediment to uh, to solar, and uh, you know that's uh, something that that hopefully technology will advance sufficiently that we can use it. All right, let's go back to our colleague Tad Weber. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to address housing at this point. Um, sure. So when um, you were campaigning uh, with Governor Newsom those years ago, he at that time said he would push for a goal of construction 3.5 million new homes by 2025. Obviously, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, the rate is something like 100,000 homes annually right now. And then uh, in May, we had the unfortunate development of the median home price in California exceeding 800,000. Yeah. yeah. So what specifically would you do as governor to increase housing production? You say on your website, you wanna make housing more affordable. How do you propose to do that? Well, this is obviously an area where I have more personal expertise because this has been my business for 35 years. Um, I understand the cost structure of what goes into building, and California uh, has some of the highest building costs in, in the in the country in the world, as far as that goes. Uh, I'm building in Indiana for a hundred to one hundred and twenty-five dollars a square foot. Uh, that cost is four, five, six hundred dollars in California. Some part of it, obviously, is the difference in the price of land in uh, in the two areas, but it's not when you know, you're building, especially when you're building multifamily, uh, you're building 20 to 25 units per acre. Uh, the cost for land is is, is relatively insignificant. Uh, the big cost in California is government. Uh, it's the delays that uh, uh, the layers of approvals are required. Uh, there's the California uh, Environmental Quality Act, uh, which was well-intentioned, but now it applies to every housing project. And creates opportunities for almost endless litigation uh, and lawsuits, uh, not to mention remediation uh, and consulting fees and, you know, uh, all the other additional costs. Uh, California also imposes incredible uh, number of mandates on builders. Uh, uh, those should be re-examined uh, and, uh, and determined if uh, those really are fulfilling what we need to fulfill. We've got to bring down the cost of housing. Just saying that we're going to increase the number of uh, or the amount of supply isn't sufficient if the cost is so high that builders tell me that they only can build luxury units uh, and luxury homes. Uh, well, that's not going to do 
uh, for a middle class family that needs a lower cost home to be able to survive and pay all their other bills. Uh, so many families in California are paying 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of their incomes in housing costs. And of course, housing is the most important thing because it's the largest expense in any household budget. And it has the effect of pushing up salaries, which push up costs in just about every aspect of society. So food, clothing, health care, government, the costs of all of those are pushed up by the cost of housing because people have to literally get paid that much more to be able to afford housing in this state. And uh, that you know, it contributes to a wage price spiral. Uh, that drives uh, all the other costs higher. And that's why the cost of living in California is really pricing uh, most middle-class families into poverty or frankly, out of the state. Um, bringing down the cost of housing is critical. And it's the first thing that I'll uh, address as, a, as the new governor. Mr. Cox, next is Jack Oman. I think you're on mute, Jack. Hey. You're technologically more astute than I am. <laughs> no, I'm not. I just no, can't hear you. I'm not lie, man. <laughs> Before I ask my real questions, how's the bear? <laughs> it's it's in great, a fine feather. I don't own the bear, you know. We only uh, used it. It's a bear that is actually a union bear. You, you'll be happy to know. It's a, it's a member of the Screen Actors Guild and has oh. been in dozens of commercials and TV shows. So uh, uh, it's fine, I'm sure. God bless you, man. Thank you for telling me. Um, yeah. It, here's a fundamental question that's facing your party right now. Um, do you think that President Trump is a liar? And I, 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 I'm not going to go there. And it, it does nothing to what I know that I'm not a liar. I know that I tell the truth. I know that I have integrity and I've built my businesses on integrity. And I also know that Gavin Newsom lacks integrity. Otherwise, he wouldn't be going out and soliciting charitable contributions to his wife's foundation. And uh, he appears unconcerned about what that looks like. So all I know is what I, uh, how I've lived my life, uh, Jack. Well, I guess, and I appreciate that. But my question is, um, and I don't want to be too repetitive, but your party right now is in the thrall of President Trump, and he's very influential. And so a person such as yourself, who has a high degree of personal integrity, I would think would be able to answer the question. I mean, do you think that he lost? You know, it's not germane. What you're trying to do is divide some Republicans who love him versus some Republicans who hate him. And you're going to try to get the whole partisan battle of 2020 reinstituted into this election. And frankly, it's obnoxious that that's what Mr. Newsom wants to do. Mr. Trump is no longer the president of the country. California is in crisis. We've got homeless homelessness that's out of control. We've got shortages of water and electricity. We've got a cost of living that average families cannot bear. We've got taxes that are outrageous, that are pushing people out of this state. We have an unfunded pension debt that needs to be addressed. And there's a whole lot of reasons that Mr. Newsom should be recalled and removed from the leadership of the state so that we can turn this state around and make it livable and affordable for people. And frankly, it, it is a bit obnoxious that, uh, that certain members you know, of the media would just wanna make this about the former president. It's not, it's about California. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I, I think when you look at actions that President Trump had, has engaged in in the last year, um, it calls into question his commitment to American democracy. And so I think it's a fundamental question. So here's another side of the question. Do you think Gavin Newsom is a liar? I think Gavin Newsom has a problem with the truth. Yes, I think Gavin Newsom told people that he was going to treat 90,000 acres of forest land, actually reiterated that earlier this year, and now it's been discovered that it was only 11,000 acres. I also believe that Mr. Newsom, you know, does things that display a lack of integrity. Again, soliciting charitable contributions from people that have business before the state at which he is making decisions about 
uh, that go to his wife's foundation uh, is a lack of integrity because it tells Mr. You know, it, it basically informs us that Mr. Newsom doesn't care about whether people trust that he's doing things because they're the right thing to do or because somebody is making a contribution to his wife's charity. Uh, as you know, I have made a, a personal point to uh, discuss the uh, the uh, influence of money in politics. And it's my mission in life in many ways to uh, bring integrity to our political system and, and do something about the uh, the uh, the actual imp impropriety as well as the appearance of impropriety. Uh, following up on that, uh, something you said earlier, Mr. Cox, you had said that even before the uh, the, the pandemic, that uh, Governor Newsom had uh, created some crises that warranted a recall instead of allowing him to finish his first term and then challenging him at the ballot box then. What were you referring to? Well, a couple of things. First of all, one of his first acts as governor was to eliminate the death penalty. Now, you may remember that I'm actually personally opposed to the death penalty, but I listened to the will of the people. The people had spoken twice, not once, but twice. They had even voted uh, pretty significantly, uh, by the way, for a, an initiative that would speed up executions. Yet the first thing that Mr. Newsom did was end the death penalty in California. Now, that may have been a good or bad decision uh, on ideological grounds, but and it may have pleased some of his supporters. But it was really a slap in the face to people who had used the democratic process, which is the initiative, to, to vote to accelerate those. If he really thought the death penalty was a bad thing, he should have gone out and argued for another initiative that would eliminate it. Instead, he did it by fiat. The other thing that what that happened uh, is that he, he ran as a guy who was going to get housing built at lower cost uh, and a, a lot more housing. Uh, take a look at what happened during 2019. Uh, housing costs went up. He he signed bills that would increase mandates and increase the cost of housing. Uh, his promises to build these vast new supplies at lower cost went totally the other way. Uh, on top of that, we, we had very little of a response to the wildfires. Uh, and uh, he also ran on the idea that he was going to do something about the waste, the horrendous waste of taxpayer money on the train in the Central Valley. Uh, he then announced that he was going to end it. Then uh, I guess he got into a row with the, uh, the president and, and, the, and the federal government about you know refunding the money and quickly reversed himself and decided to keep wasting money on that project uh, that's hopelessly behind schedule and way over budget. Uh, so there, there are many, many things that this governor did even before the pandemic that uh, got people to believe that they had made the wrong decision in 2018. So Mr. Cox, I, uh, I personally have written um, criticizing the governor particularly on the issue mm -hmm. of the way that public schools were closed as long as they were during the pandemic when mm -hmm. private and parochial schools were not. And the impact that has had here in Sacramento, not just now, but previously, is that the people with means pull yeah. their kids out of yeah. the Sacramento City Unified School District and send them to private and parochial schools because they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to deal with the politics. And I have criticized the governor for uh, insisting that um, that uh, part of reopening schools uh, would involve um, uh, districts signing a memorandum of understanding with their labor partners. Now, when you have bad faith labor partners, as we do in Sacramento, and I speak as the parent of two public school kids who missed their entire junior year of high school, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, it's difficult to impossible to get a, a workable MOU that considers the interests of the children first and not the adults. So so I'm with you on that part. With the well, government. let's talk about education. Well, 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 uh, just, one, yeah. well, but just one second, but here's my point. Here's my question yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. I don't know how a Republic, an isolated Republican governor with Legislate with two uh, houses with super majorities uh, 
of Democrats would be able to move the needle on that issue. I don't see how you'd be able to pull CTA out of the schoolhouse door so my kids could go. I, I, I just don't see how you could do that. So well, what, I'm sure what, what would you do? Well, okay. That's a couple of questions, but let's let's first address the political question, and that is, how am I going to get anything done with this legislature? I'm coming into office with a whole list of common sense ideas that I'm going to present to this legislature, and I hope to work with this legislature. I truly hope that there are people there of good uh, of good intention who want to save this state and 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 save the people of the state and and prevent uh, the people from moving out and, and give people a, an affordable and livable life. So I'm going to propose reforms on reducing housing costs, on providing water and electricity and a fix for homelessness and crime and fire and all those things. But you're right. I have no misconceptions about the idea that uh, this legislature hasn't acted to change these things. As a matter of fact, many of these things they've made worse uh, with the leadership of the governor, uh, Newsom, as well as Brown. So What's going to have to happen is that we're going to have to change the legislature ultimately, potentially. If this legislature is not willing to work with me, I'm going to recruit people who will be, who hopefully will see as I do that there are common sense solutions to each one of these problems. That and, and I'm optimistic that these problems can be solved. I know they can be solved with a with, with common sense solutions. And I'm going to recruit people and I'm going to help them get elected in, in districts. And we'll, we'll pick out the eight or 10 districts that we believe will be the, will be the most fruitful for us. And, and we'll hopefully work to get people who will, will think about these common sense ideas and solutions and not be worried about the CTA or some other interest group that's going to come after them. Uh, that's going to be a tough gig, but it's got to happen. This state has got to fix itself. We can't keep going down the road of, of, of a shortage of electricity and water and, and, and a lack of wildfire capability and the, the, the crime that's increased and the homelessness and the cost of living and the taxes. We can't keep doing this. We've got to solve these problems. Uh, now, let's get to education because this is a, a subject that's near and dear to me. One of my first entries in the public life, I was the president of a school board uh, back in Illinois. Uh, I've also been a teacher, and I'm the son of a, a public school teacher, as you might know. My mother was a Chicago public school teacher, so I've seen public education up close. What's happened over the last 40, 50 years is that education has become political. It's all the politics and it's because of the money what i would propose and i love the idea of public funding of education but let's publicly fund education savings accounts as you rightly pointed out gavin newsom and i have every ability to send our children to private schools because we're wealthy and most families don't have that ability so i absolutely favor putting the power of education in the hands of the parents Let's take the 14 or 18 or $20,000, whatever we spend per child, put it in the hands of an education savings account for parents to control, and let the principles of the free market and competition mean that our children get the greatest education. Uh, I'd like to see a bidding war for teachers. I think teachers would benefit when they're treated like the professionals they are, as opposed to political pawns, which frankly you know, uh, is the situation to some degree today. Uh, let's get the politics completely out of our education system. Let's get our education system to be the most excellent that it can be. We are, that is absolutely necessary if our children are going to compete. And particularly if our children who are born into less than ideal circumstances, as you guys know, my father left when I was a baby. Uh, I never saw him again. And I, my mom had to raise me. And she pounded into myself and my brothers and sister that education is absolutely the most important thing. And, you know, uh, it's something no one can ever take away from you. And it's something that's going to guarantee you're going to be able to feed your family and have success in the future. And that's exactly why I'm in the position I am in today. And there's nothing more important to me, frankly, than making sure that our educational system is run for the parents and not the politicians. I want to get politics 
clear completely of our education system. You can tell I feel very strongly about that. I can, as a fellow Midwesterner, I can sense your passion. Uh, John, you referred earlier to um, what you would do to work with a, a, a legislature where there are Democratic supermajorities. And so your answer was, well, basically, I'd find eight or 10 districts and we would target. No, no, I said, let's be clear, Jack. I said, first, I will present proposals and ask sure. them to act on it. If they sure. fail to do so, I will certainly then work to change them. Of yes. course. And I mean, that's the, that's the political process. Now, Correct. you have proposed a couple of uh, things earlier when you were living in California, uh, one of which was to propose a, a ballot measure in 2016 requiring political leaders to wear patches on their clothing like NASCAR. And then you propose that the, the legislature- Let the record show, by the way, that that was a tongue in cheek initiative that I did not intend for that to actually be implemented, that I was doing that to demonstrate the folly that we have of the fact that our legislators, for, by and large, are professional fundraisers. And that's sad because they represent districts that are way, way too large. As you remember, I proposed a reform that would reduce the size of those legislators and take money out of the equation, which I absolutely believe is ultimately going to get me necessary at some point. Well, I'm very pleased to hear that that was tongue in cheek because it's a widely used political cartoon metaphor. Um, well, I, I got the idea from Bill Maher, by the way. So oh, did you? Well, probably one of your, he's probably, I didn't come up with it on my own. If Bill Maher did it first. Well, I think- I'll give him appropriate credit. been doing it for 20 years, but you know. Anyway, um, so, but you did propose expanding the size of the legislature. Right? Absolutely. And yeah. so what was that number again? Well, it was 12,000 total, but only 120 go to Sacramento, as you well know. It was mischaracterized quite extensively by, by pundits, frankly, by some conservatives who thought I was off my rocker in terms of, a, of as a conservative. Uh, but uh, only 120 legislators ever go, got to Sacramento. The 12,000 number referred to people all across the state who participated in selecting the 120 that would go to Sacramento. So is that kind of an electoral college in some Yeah, way? I guess some people compared it to that. But see, the, the trouble in California, again, is that you know, in, a, in a district the size of ours, uh, 500,000 for an assembly and a million for a Senate district, it, money is the most important factor in elections. It really is. And uh, that empowers the funders. I want to empower the people. I want money out of politics. And and I think this, I, I you know, listen, I still think that that was a good reform and maybe someday, uh, you know, I'm, I'm running out of years, I'm 66, but uh, maybe someday we'll, we'll, we'll figure out that maybe it was a, a thing to do. Thanks. Uh, we will next go to Todd Weber. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to swing back to the campaign for a second. So I'm sure you know the recent poll that just came out earlier this week yeah. shows um, Mr. Elder with a nearly double-digit lead over you and some of the other folks. So how do you plan to overtake him? Well, listen, uh, I like Larry Elder. I, I was on his show in 2018. He said I'd be a good governor. Uh, I think he's, you know, he's got a, a name recognition factor uh, that's given him an initial uh, burst here. Uh, but I think people want the problems in this state fixed. Uh, we've tried media personalities in the past, uh, Mr. Schwarzenegger in particular, and that didn't seem to work. Uh, we've tried politicians. Uh, we, what we've seen around the country, by the way, are business persons, uh, mostly men, uh, we we can point to Larry Hogan in Maryland and Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, who are both Republican businessmen who were elected in very, very blue states. As a matter of fact, I think by most measures, Maryland and Massachusetts are both probably more democratically tilted than California. And both of those governors are uh, very popular. And and Mr. Hogan is a, is a conservative. Uh, 
you know, Mr. Baker may well be more moderate, but the point is they're both business people. They both focus on getting things done. And if you and the people of this state give me the chance to be your governor, that's what I'll work on. I'm not doing this for partisan reasons. I'm not doing this as an ideologue. I'm doing this because this state needs to work for people. It needs to function. It needs to provide opportunity. It needs to be basically provide basic materials of life, housing, electricity, water, uh, an opportunity to have your own small business. That's what enabled me to climb out of the, the, the lower economic rungs of the ladder. It was a, a, my own small business. Do you know how difficult it is to start and, and actually run a small business in this state today? The, the licensing requirements, the legal requirements, the regulations are just enormous. And big business doesn't care about those things. Big business, they just hire another lawyer or accountant to, to deal with them. It's small businesses like mine that can't get going. And that means there's a whole bunch of people like me who start at the bottom and have absolutely no chance to rise. So, you know, uh, this this recall is extremely important to, to turn this state around and, and get it so that people have opportunity. John, I want to talk about wildfires for a second. Before I was yeah. at the B, I was... Uh, in wine country for five years, working for newspapers up there. And I saw, you know, the reality before, Sad. during, and after of, of what wildfires can do in this state. And uh, Governor Newsom met today with, with the president and, and talked, you know, about the federal response. And, and I wonder what you kind of make of, of the federal government's role within California's mitigation, as well as its actual response <laughs> and what needs to be done um, in your mind to kind of improve on those fronts. Let's talk about three things. First of all, as we know, we need to better manage the forest. We need to remove dead trees. We need to do prescribed burns. We need to build fire breaks. I mean, the Native Americans did these things and they dealt with fire as well as we are. So I mean, we need to do those things. Secondly, we need to have a much better response to the fires. Uh, I had written an article, uh, I don't know, maybe about a year ago about uh, uh, an air armada, uh, an air force, if you will. I mean, we're spending $4 million uh, a day on uh, a train to nowhere in the Central Valley that very few people are gonna ride, we could be redirecting those monies to leasing uh, airplanes. I mean, big jets that are just sitting on the ground because of the pandemic, frankly, they can be outfitted with tanks. And I'm talking like 50 or 100 of them. And with satellite technology, we can pinpoint a fire in a moment. The minute you see a smoke plume, bam, you go and you apply overwhelming force of water and you, you stop these fires from becoming infernos. The problem with these fires is that because of all the tinder in the forest, they become infernos before you can get any response to them. Uh, and with an air uh, cover, you can do that. The, the third thing that I would talk about is I would talk about reviving the lumber industry, the timber industry in California. We, you know, we used to have over a hundred working sawmills in this state and and they operated on federal land as well as state land and you know we basically ran them out of business with regulations and lawsuits and everything's like that and you know listen they took care of the forest because that's their inventory they cut trees clearly but they also replanted trees because that's their future inventory they also built fire breaks and they also did prescribe burns and built roads in so you could get into a fire quickly. So, you know, uh, we, we didn't end the timber industry. We just moved it to Canada. And now we import uh, a good chunk of our lumber and we employ Canadians. And we had the perverse process where we put a tariff on Canadian lumber to protect the few remaining U.S. lumber companies. It's, it's just an incredible uh, you know, mistake by government, frankly, and and we ought to we ought to reexamine that and 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 get it. We're going to still use lumber. We got to build houses. We have we have more people. We we got to build houses. So lumber is the best way to do that uh, in in terms of cost and, and structure. Uh, so let's 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 do it in California. Let's make that money and let's create jobs and create uh, earnings for people here. Uh, there's also, you know, tens of thousands of Californians being kicked off their insurance plans uh, because yes. of wildfire dangers. Yes. And, you know, obviously very counter to 
most conservative beliefs, it would probably require some form of regulation. I mean, what do you feel like needs to be done to to kind of take control of that situation so Californians aren't paying even more after disaster strikes? Well, wait a minute. When I, when, I believe it's the free market. Uh, I actually, as a CPA, I was an insurance company specialist. State Farm was one of my clients when I worked at Coopers and Library in, in Chicago. So insurance companies price risk. That's what they're in business to do. And you're absolutely right. Insurance premiums have basically, you know, zoomed out of control if you can even get insurance in some parts of California today. It's, a, it's not even available in some parts. Uh, so what we need is we need to bring down the cost of insurance again with a, a more definitive and complete response to wildfires, which includes, again, fixed wing aircraft. I didn't mention, by the way, you know, Mr. Newsom's bought helicopters, but you know, helicopters have a problem. You know, you can't really operate them in, a, in Santa Ana winds. And, and once a fire gets to be an inferno, it actually creates its own wind and, and makes helicopters very dangerous. Fixed wing aircraft don't have those kinds of limitations uh, nearly as much as, as helicopters do. So you're right about insurance. Let's bring it down with a much better response with the other things I talked about in terms of forest management and building up the the, the timber or bringing back the timber industry to California. And uh, we'll bring down those insurance rates. Okay, we have time for a couple more. So let's go to Stephanie Finucan. Okay. Um, in addition to wildfires, California is experiencing another climate-related catastrophe, which is sea level rise. Cliffs are eroding in some coastal communities, causing some painful discussions about managed retreat. What role do you think the state should play in this? Well, uh, I, I already told you what I would do about global pollution that, that could be causing climate change. And that is, let's get the world off of coal. Let's get China and India to use American natural gas that's liquefied in California so that we can reduce global pollution. Uh, Californians have done wonderful things to reduce our global footprint, and that's great, uh, but it's gone overboard and, and it's created a situation where families can't afford uh, gasoline prices and, and, and electricity and all the other things. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm obviously, uh, sea level rise is certainly an issue. Uh, it, it may well be because of the way the climate is changing. Uh, that could be cyclical. It may not be cyclical. I'm not a, an expert enough to, to opine on that. Uh, clearly, I think measures should be taken in low-lying areas. Uh, I live in an area down here where I can see the, the cliffs, and certainly there's erosion going on, but they're, it, they're certainly not high enough to cause uh, a lot of danger to most places. Um, in Del Mar, there's some areas there where the local authorities have decided to uh, work with the uh, the homeowners on, uh, on a situation of managed retreat, or at least have, have begun the process of discussing the limits on uh, on uh, expansion of a home that's near the ocean. Uh, I think that should be done more on a local basis uh, with help from the state potentially, I suppose. Uh, 